Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Storms. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the executive director at the ACLU of Washington. I'm really excited to welcome you to another Virtual Flights and Rights, our third one. Thank you for joining us. Tonight, the speakers and I join you from the occupied territory of the Coast Salish and Yakima people. We remember that indigenous people were lied to, treaties were broken, and land was stolen. Acknowledgement is a critical and necessary step toward honoring Native communities and having a larger conversation on decolonization and reconciliation. We acknowledge that coronavirus is not the first of life-threatening diseases that have been introduced into Native communities. We're coming together this evening to talk about COVID-19 as having a disproportionately devastating impact on people of color. We come together in recognition that this impact is not because people of color are more susceptible to disease, but because structural racism has created systems and barriers that produce and reproduce inequality and inequity along racial lines and has done that for hundreds of years in this country. The problems we will talk about tonight do not exist in a vacuum. They exist against this backdrop of intentionally created racial inequity. Right now, I am grieving the loss of George Floyd, who was brutally murdered by police earlier this week. I am grieving a land where a white woman can threaten a black man that she will call the police and claim he is causing her harm when she full well knows he's not. These are not COVID problems, but they are our problems. And if we want the America that is truly great, we have to continue to grapple with and solve these problems. I couldn't begin this evening without sharing those reflections, but I'm gonna step back a little bit and do a little of housekeeping with you about what to expect this evening. And I wanna introduce our speakers who I am so proud to share this Zoom stage with. As you know, our flights and rights events are typically hosted in breweries and event spaces around the state. Most often the gathering space of KEXP, 90.3 FM in Seattle, and KEXP.org everywhere else in the world. Right now we are gonna be joined by OC Notes, host of KEXP Sunday Soul, to share a few words with us before we begin our program. Hold on for just a moment, it's coming. Tune into us on any of those mediums, and we'll be good. 
thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining us. We love you. We appreciate you. Thank you, OC Notes, and thank you, KEXP. And also, you can hop over to Spotify after our talk to listen to OC Notes playlist, specially curated for tonight's flights and rights. So make your dinner if you haven't already, enjoy a beverage, dance with yourself, your roommates, your family, your cat, your dog. Music makes things feel a lot better, and it's a beautiful two and a half hours of it. There's going to be the link in the chat box for you to learn how to connect to the Spotify. So in addition to KEXP's generosity and support, which we so appreciate, each in-person flights and rights is typically sponsored by a local brewery. And we also want you to check out the chat box for a link to our partner breweries. It's a tough time for small businesses. And if you can help, that's wonderful. Since the start of the coronavirus in Washington state, we have been strategizing around the government response. We don't do this work alone. With our allies, we're working to ensure measures are grounded in science and public health, not politics or xenophobia. Across the country, the ACLU has taken more than 110 COVID-related legal actions. We've worked to make sure that 26,000 people have been released from jails and prisons, which are virtual death traps in the face of a global pandemic, or that they're never brought into the criminal legal system to begin with. 400 of our own clients here in Washington have been released from ICE detention. Here in Washington, we've successfully, successfully worked to reduce our jail population by half. Over 5,000 people have been released between mid-March and early May. The Department of Corrections has released approximately 1,000 people from our state prisons in response to COVID-19. So there is hope. Still, as I've mentioned earlier tonight and in our previous virtual flights and rights events, COVID-19 is impacting people of color disproportionately. We're here tonight to unpack this with some of our allies. And while an hour is enough time to just barely scratch the surface, I know you'll learn a lot from these brilliant and beautiful humans. So first we'll hear from Crystal Pardue. Crystal is an Equal Justice Works Fellow with the ACLU of Washington. She just waved. Her primary passion is advocating for Native American students facing disproportionately high levels of discipline and policing in Washington public schools. Crystal believes in a community first approach to lawyering and seeks to uplift Native voices, ideas, and culture throughout legal and political systems. Crystal attended the University of Washington School of Law, where she focused her studies on civil rights and tribal governments. As a native woman of color from the Chumash Nation, she identifies with the community she serves and deeply understands the unique cultural barriers affecting native students' progress in education. I'm also beyond excited to have with us Ebony Miranda. Ebony is a community organizer whose work centers around the LGBTQIA community and communities of color. In 2017, they were an organizer and social media chair for the Women's March in Seattle. In 2018, they founded Black Lives Matter Seattle, King County, and are currently the board chair. As a representative for BLM, they have done work with the Families Belong Together Coalition and Seattle Indivisible, where they currently serve as an advisory board member. We're also lucky to have with us Michael Bion, Executive Director of the Asian Counseling and Referral Service. Michael has worked for nearly 25 years on health disparities, social justice, and immigrant and refugee issues with a focus on AAPIs and other underserved communities. Before his ACRS appointment in December 2018, Michael served as CEO and Executive Director of Asian Services in Action, Inc., the largest health and social services agency in Ohio, focused, in, focused on empowering Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, immigrants, and refugees. Mr. Bien has served on several state and national boards and advisories within the AAPI community. In 2015, he was appointed by Ohio Governor John Kasich as chair of the Ohio AAPI Advisory Council, and in 2014 was appointed by President Barack Obama to the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. He currently serves as board chair for the National Coalition of Asian Pacific American Community Development and is a founding member for the National AIM for Equity. 
Mr. Bian earned his MPA from the University of Washington and is a 2015 German Marshall Fund Fellow and a 2009-10 Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Fellow. Finally, I'm thrilled to be joined by Gabriel Munoz. Gabriel is the son of immigrant parents from Mexico. He was born in Los Angeles, California and raised in Wapato, Washington, a small town in the lower Yakima Valley where he and his family worked as migrant farm workers. He's one of nine children raised in a Spanish speaking household where he learned the lessons of hard work and dedication. Gabriel is a proud United States Army veteran who served his country honorably. His passion to serve and help others is something that he experiences every day as the diversion program manager and life skills instructor for People for People, a nonprofit organization in Yakima. Gabriel is also the vice chair of Latino Civic Alliance, a statewide advocacy organization with board members all across Washington state. LCA's mission is to help Latinos have access to local and state government through education, civic engagement, and voter registration. For the last 15 years, LCA has organized the largest Latino political platform in Olympio during Latino Legislative Day. Gabriel is married to his beautiful wife, Anahi Munoz, and together they're raising two amazing daughters. Gabriel is truly grateful to have the opportunity to serve the Yakima Valley. It's his personal goal to see that the Yakima Valley becomes a better place to live, work, and raise children. Gabriel's belief is serve others before oneself. So we're going to get started with this. Audience, you're free to jump in with questions whenever you like. You'll type your questions or feedback at any time in the Q&A, and you can check the chat box for other links and other details. Um, and, but for now, we're going to go through each of the speakers. And so, Crystal, uh, you have the floor. Haku, teats kali, lahu wa pushur chips. Sam no neat crystal, waya. Hi everybody, I hope you're all well. My name is Crystal and I thank you so much for joining today. Like Michelle had said, COVID-19 is impacting indigenous peoples in uniquely devastating ways, both in the ways that it is affecting our bodies physically and spreading through our communities, but also in the ways that it's affecting our livelihoods. Uh, the first issue I wanna talk about today is the over-incarceration of indigenous peoples here in this country which has been going on since contact. Over-incarceration means that Native people are over-policed and over-represented in carceral settings, which in the COVID-19 pandemic, it creates dangerous spreading situations where we're seeing that people that are incarcerated are getting the disease at a much quicker rate because of the close contact. Our office has done a lot of advocacy and multiple organizations have done advocacy around releasing people from the jails and prisons. But as long as in this state and in the rest of the country, Native people continue to be overrepresented in those settings, the Native people will be disproportionately experiencing that quicker spread of COVID exacerbated by the close contact incarceration. There's also major inequities in healthcare access and healthcare outcomes in the indigenous communities that are made worse by the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that pre-existing conditions, some of the pre-existing conditions that exacerbate the symptoms and the spread of COVID-19 through somebody's body can be diabetes, asthma, high blood pressure, just to name a few. We also know that native people have some of the highest rates of these. And that's because, not because of anything that we've done ourselves, but because of attempted slow genocide. These types of things were rare pre-contact, but after contact and through forced diet changes and the forced stop of ancestral ways of living and eating and diets, these, these conditions show up more prevalently in Native, in native uh, communities and it's shown and illustrated through DNA changes that, the, that that has had an impact on our bodies. There's also historic failure to honor treaty rights and provide adequate medical care through the Indian Health Services. And there's continued underfunding in the pandemic's response. We see that Native nations around the country get far less money that they need to adequately care for the citizens to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. And now we saw that just as recently as a couple of weeks ago, the Doctors Without Borders for the very first time in the US history is deployed in our own 
nation, and that's to the Navajo Nation because the numbers there are so high and it's running so quickly through that community because of historical and current inequities in access to healthcare. So the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting indigenous bodies in a disproportionately devastating way because of those, those pre-existing systemic oppressions, systems of oppression, but it's also affecting our livelihoods. So for example, with the education situation we have now, with the stay at home and the learn at home setups, the, the impacts of the school closures on native children mean that native children are disproportionately not able to access the online materials. And that's for a couple of reasons. Here in Washington state and in urban areas like Seattle and in urban areas around the country, native American children are more likely to be to have unsecure housing or to be facing homelessness or to be living in rural areas. Both of those home setups creates problems for receiving technology like laptops and tablets to connect to online materials. And in the rural areas, the broadband issue, the broadband access issue is huge. While the housing units on remote non-tribal areas have about a 72% average a connectivity to broadband capability, that's compared to 46%, a nearly 25% difference that we're seeing in tribal remote areas. So those kids that are on the tribal remote areas, they're struggling with not only not having technology to connect to schooling, but they're not having broadband access. So Native American children that are already being disproportionately uh, underserved by the school system pre-COVID are now not even being able to access education at all. Uh, so these, these systems of oppression that have largely exist, existed pre-COVID and that have existed since contact with Native American tribes and nations exist today and are made worse uh, by COVID. And I appreciate the time to talk today. Ebony, you may go ahead. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, and thank you to the ACLU for having me here today. Um, before I get to my main talking points, I really just want to take a quick moment to just acknowledge all that's happening right now. As Michelle mentioned at the beginning of this discussion, there is a lot of grief and anger and um, just feelings of maybe despair, dissatisfaction, anxiety, and people feeling scared right now. Um, this pandemic is already having great effects on the black community and the fact that we still have to fear for our lives in the face of police brutality and white supremacy is an added effect on that. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone for being here today and listening to this talk. Um, and although it may not feel like we can do much right now, that gathering may not seem like the best option that you being here and listening and learning and participating in this discussion does make a difference and it does have a really big impact on all that's happening. Um, so I wanted to give just a little bit of background on myself, my work with Black Lives Matter, Seattle King County and how our work has transformed and adjusted to the current circumstances um, in this pandemic. So as it was mentioned, Black Lives Matter, Seattle King County, with was founded by myself along with two other individuals, including our former chair and one of our current board members. We are a volunteer-led grassroots social justice nonprofit organization focused on the empowerment and liberation of Black and other people of color. Um, and our mission is to dismantle anti-Black systems and policies of oppression. So with that, so far, um, as an organization, we have been involved in multiple discussions, mainly with the uh, King County Executive's Office addressing various issues such as conducting a countywide audit of biased crimes, racial harassment and discrimination, a mandatory review of the inquest process uh, that should occur at least every five years, vacating all existing marijuana convictions in King County, the abolishment of cash bail for most nonviolent crimes, and the decriminalization of fair evasion, and that's just to name a few things. And within the last year, our main focus has been on our outreach and education campaign for the 2020 census. And so the question may be, how does the census 
and counting everyone kind of relate to COVID-19 and race and what are the impacts of those things right now. And for me, I believe that census data is more vital than ever now, given the circumstances that we're in and that it's absolutely crucial that we do get a complete count of all uh, black indigenous and people of color in Washington state. And there are a few reasons for that. Primarily being that already historically black and brown communities are already undercounted in the census. And a few examples of what the census and what the data from the 2020 census would contribute to in our communities and the funds that would be distributed, they would contribute to schools, affordable housing, hospitals, public transportation, free and reduced lunch in WIC, just to name a few, and the list goes on and on and on. So already we can kind of see that some of those things that I listed already, if they were underfunded currently, that would already lead to a great impact on those communities currently right now. And so it's important that we make sure that the communities that are suffering the most right now get those resources. And in order to really do that, we need to have the proper data for that. Um, and not only that, but it also determines uh, how many representatives are in our Congress. And with an election year coming up, that also has lasting impacts. Census data lasts for 10 years and think about the amount of elections that occurs within that time. So already we're seeing the effects of what being undercounted means in terms of this pandemic and the lack of data is already becoming prevalent in the numbers that we're seeing in terms of cases. Um, there was a article in the Seattle Times recently that did that kind of published an analysis by the Seattle and King County Public Health Department. And it has a quote that says, quote, the analysis includes an overlay of case data on census tract maps to generally show that higher cases rates exist in South Seattle and South King County, where more people of color live. Limited data by occupation and by neighborhood makes it challenging to dig, dip, to dig deeper at this point. So that in itself, it's proving that as we continue to see the effects of this through our communities, as we continue to see the data that black people are, I believe it, the rate is like two times per capita as compared to white people in terms of getting COVID-19. We're already seeing that not only are the rates of infection much higher in our communities, but being able to accurately track that data is proven to be difficult. And these are crucial times. This is the time to be as accurate as we can. Um, and the fact that we are undercounted, it just makes that even more difficult um, to see that. So furthermore from that, um, besides the census data, uh, BIPOC also make up the majority of essential workers and essential workers are more at risk for contracting COVID-19 and therefore infection rates in the communities of people that are made up of primarily essential workers are also most like more likely to contract the virus. Um, sorry, <laughs> I lost my point there, but um, kind of in conclusion, when we have communities that have a lack of resources, uh, le less access to health care, child care, struggling to have livable, livable wages, it makes it harder for us to truly thrive in this pandemic, to, to have a chance of surviving. Um, and so, sorry, I keep on losing my place. Um, also, this is just very hard to talk about right now, if I'm just going to be honest for a moment. This has been a very, very troubling week for myself and my community. Um, and I'm just really feeling the weight of that right now. Um, but in conclusion, what I am trying to say is that yes, it is important that we get a complete count of all Black, Indigenous, and people of color in the state of Washington, um, as it gives our communities a chance to fight back and to be able to live through this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ebony. And yeah, you know, we're, we're all um, really just trying to deal with the weight of a number of things right now. And we were talking about this a little bit before the program began that the weight of COVID-19 of itself is so powerful for just all of us as human beings, for all of us as people of color who are disproportionately impacted. And then when you put on top of that um, police violence right now. Um, so anyway, I just wanna um, thank you, Ebony. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Michael and Gabriel who haven't spoken yet and just 
let that let that sit with us um, how hard it is. And I'm really grateful for everybody for showing up this evening because it's it has indeed been a very hard week. Um, Michael, if you're able, I'd love to have you share now. Thank you. A big thank you to the ACLU for hosting this event. And I'm just really honored to be with Christo, Ebony, and Gabriel on this call. I want to take a moment just to share a little bit about our organization, Asian Counseling and Referral Service, before I go into a few of the key comments related to how our communities have been impacted uh, during COVID-19. So Asian Counseling and Referral Service was founded 47 years ago, and we are grounded and rooted in social justice work um, in the social services and healthcare services that we provide. Um, in the work that we do in community, we do it in coalition with communities of color and other underserved communities. And we've been very active in issues around police accountability, working closely with ACLU and others, working on undocumented communities and supporting them with LCA. Most recently, we worked with other members of our coalition to ask the state to address the deep concern related to the Department of Licensing and them sharing information with ICE uh, related to immigration status of individuals who are getting licenses at the different locations. Um, in addition, we are also working on issues of labor and working class folks, those who are um, lower wage earners. Um, and I will share a little bit more how that's been impacting our communities as well. So as far as COVID-19 is concerned, one of the key things that um, I wanna share with you is the fact that within our Asian American and Pacific Islander community, we are confronting a double whammy of sorts. Uh, most specific that I can share with you in the aftermath of the first case of, uh, identified here in the US and prior to that, um, when it was first identified in China, we saw direct immediate impact in our communities and what is most specific is within our Asian run businesses. In the Chinatown International District, we saw a decrease in business ranging from 20 to 70 percent um, in, the, in the aftermath of the information that was coming out of China. Following that, when the cases uh, hit, the first cases hit here in the U.S., and with the new public health guidance that uh, required uh, restrictions for businesses, we saw them suffering even more in, in a more acute way. Um, and so that is something that I think about right now, even in during this recovery phase of how it's gonna be difficult for those community folks that are running small businesses and um, how it's gonna to continue to be a struggle, even with the lifting of restrictions um, in terms of access to restaurants and businesses, we will continue to see. And the FBI had announced even prior to, early on in this whole pandemic, about a warning that there will be a rise and increase in hate crimes, bias, harassment, and discrimination. And even locally, we are seeing this um, increasing significantly in the local media. There was an instance of multiple situations of individuals that were attacked um, and, and harassed or uh, violently pushed. And, and so these are things that are really concerning to our communities. The other important thing to share about COVID-19 and its impact on our Asian American and Pacific Islander community is the fact that the impact of COVID-19 isn't even across all of our communities. What we're seeing in the data that has been released by public health is the disproportionate impact on Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islander population, in addition to our indigenous communities, our African American communities, and our Latinx communities. And for the reasons, including the fact that we are disproportionately represented in essential service, lower wage um, positions, whether you're a grocery clerk, whether you're in janitorial services, um, our communities are re represented in essential service operation where they are exposed and are at higher risk. So this is something that we think about and we try to elevate that um, within our Asian American Pacific Honor community that our Native Hawaiian and Pacific Honor community are facing tremendous challenges um, that we do need to uplift. In addition to the rate of increase, um, rate of COVID-19 cases, as well as death that are disproportionately higher in our Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community, 
recent statistics that were provided through the Pandemic Community Advisory Group that uh, Seattle King County have put together shows that in terms of the recent unemployment claims, we're seeing higher rates of unemployment claims among indigenous communities, African-American, Latinx, and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander. So again, if you couple that with the incidence of higher rate of COVID-19 cases and death, and then also the economic impact, I think this is something that we need to think very carefully, collectively together to see what we can do um, to address these issues as a community. The last thing that I want to share with you and something that I've been thinking about a lot is the pr prevalence of anti-blackness within our communities and more specifically about uh, the situation on social media where many of the reports um, that have been shown um, portray a very false narrative uh, regarding um, the attacks and violent attacks and harassment and discrimination that has been on the rise here due to COVID-19 and how AAPIs are impacted that way. And this is something that I think we need to grapple with as a community, as an Asian American and Pacific Islander community, about ways that anti-Blackness exists within our own um, racial community and how we need to combat that and how it's really important, especially of recent with George Floyd in Minneapolis, um, the importance that we need to join in solidarity with other black and brown folks to address issues around police um, lethal use of for force. Um, and this is something that I'm thinking about a lot as uh, one of the um, officers that were identified as Asian American, and this has been circulated widely via social media among different Asian American Pacific Islander um, pages and, and links. And something that I think about related to that is, again, this need to internally within our own um, racial community to address anti-Blackness, but also to think um, beyond that in terms of the culture of anti-Blackness uh, within law enforcement and how regardless of who that, uh, the color of that officer's skin, it permeates in, in such a way that creates such violence uh, for our African-American communities. And so this is something that I've been recently thinking a lot about and wondering what we can do collectively um, to address it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you know, one of the things that uh, I was taught a long time ago is when uh, groups, uh, minority groups or groups that have been placed in vulnerable places are pitted against each other, the question you wanna ask is who's winning? And uh, it's not any of us. And so I really appreciate your message of you know, solidarity. Gabriel, um, really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. I really appreciate being here today with with everybody, uh, especially everybody that's listening out there. I know that during this epidemic, we've had our share uh, 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 our share time in terms of participating in Zoom meetings, and sometimes uh, we're in Zoom meetings all day. And um, I really want to thank everybody who's listening right now for doing one more today. Um, you know, one of the things that I want to talk about today is uh, the Latino community here in the Yakima County. Um, and it's, it's great that, um, yeah, that we're having this discussion because there's still a lot of people in the Yakima County that are going to work. 63% um, of all the workforce here in the Yakima County are considered essential workers. You know, and after, as of Wednesday, May 27, yesterday, we had 3,252 confirmed cases of COVID-19. You know, that's 23% uh, positive, uh, positive rate, much higher than the state's 6% rate, or that of King County, the most populous county in the state at 18, making the Yakima County the highest rate of positive COVID-19 cases on the West Coast. Um, Latinos make up more than 38% of all positive COVID-19 cases, even though they're they are only 13% of the population. Because of this, Latino Civic Alliance has been working extremely hard with community members across the state of Washington to create awareness and inform our local and state government officials 
about the problems that Latinos face every day during this epidemic. LCA, in partnership with Washington State Commission on Hispanic Affairs, created a Zoom meeting place for Latinos and organizations from across the state to inform and work together for solutions to some of the challenges that we're facing in our communities. We've been focusing on three issues during this epidemic, education, farm workers, and access to health care. Um, when we talk about farm workers. Many farm workers are testing positive for COVID-19 and the majority of them are Latinos. They're getting infected because many warehouses and farms aren't supplying workers the right protective equipment like face masks as well as following state guidelines, guidelines of social distancing. This is a big problem because many of the ag workers are undocumented and are afraid to voice their concerns because they are afraid of the possibility of retaliation or deportation. It's gotten so bad that over 800 workers from seven different warehouses here in the Yakima County went on strike because of these conditions. Many of them are getting infected and many of them are going home and infecting their family members. We've been demanding from the very beginning of, of this epidemic for stricter, uh, stricter guidelines but our government didn't do anything until it was apparent that hundreds of farm workers were testing positive. Um, education. Before I move to education, um, they, they are putting more guidelines and they, they are talking to more employers here in the Yakima County, but the rates continue to rise. And, and so those are some of the things that we really want um, you know, people to understand that a lot of these cases are due to the fact that they're working in these confined spaces sometimes right next to each other. Um, when we talk about education here in the Yakima County, it's, it's a very big problem. Again, these are huge um, problems that we're all facing with because of the type of work that we have here in the Yakima Valley. It's mainly agriculture. And so if you have 60% of the workforce that are essential and 80% of those essential workers are Latinos, then you have a lot of parents that are going to work and leaving their children at home. And so even with access to technology to do online classes, a lot of these children don't have adult supervision. Um, they're 12, 14 years old, maybe even six or seven that are taking care of each other. And so when the class starts, many of them aren't used to sitting down and turning on the computer or their phones and learning online. And because of the lack of supervision sometimes, um, some of these kids are falling behind even more than they were before. And when you have some of these parents that are coming back from work, um, even though they're there to use it, they have the opportunity to use the technology. Many of those parents don't know how to use a computer and there's a, line, a language barrier. Again, this is creating a big problem because many of these students are falling behind. These are just some of the issues that a lot of these students are going through and a lot of the parents as well. When we're talking about healthcare, workers are not and this is not because they don't want to go to the doctor and it's not because they're not sick enough, but a lot of these agriculture workers, uh, Latino workers are not going to the doctor because one, they think that they're going to get deported. Um, many of them think that they're, it's going to be too expensive. And there's, there's a lot of rumors out here and there's a lot of people saying things that uh, aren't true. Like if you do test positive for COVID-19, that you may lose your eligibility to become a resident in the future. These are some of the issues that we've been working on uh, for several weeks now. And Latino Civic Alliance with, again, in partnership with so many other organizations, we've been working together to find solutions um, to help our local officials, to help our le legislators understand what these uh, issues are and to come up with the solution. Again, um, I want to thank uh, um, I want to thank you for having us on, and uh, I appreciate any questions that I may answer after this. 
Thank you so much, Gabriel. And thank you so much, all of you. I really loved Gabriel's point about um, it's another Zoom call after a day probably full of many Zoom calls for most people. Um, but these issues are so important. And I'm also really appreciative of uh, the emotion I heard in so many of your voices because the topic that we're talking about is something that is literally life and death in our communities. Um, and we feel it deeply. Um, uh, because we live in those communities and love people in those communities and and want all of our communities to thrive So just a lot of gratitude to all of you who are listening and a lot of gratitude to those of you who are here to speak um, And I have all kinds of questions for all of you about so many things But um, I actually want to catch one of the audience questions that just came up That was pretty interesting. I guess there was a, a I didn't catch this myself, but I guess there was an article in the Seattle Times about a really high increase in cases in young people, 40 and under. And I'm just wondering if any of you all are seeing that um, in the communities that you're working with, if you're seeing that actual impact now of younger people getting diagnosed. And any one of you can answer if you have something to add. I don't, um, I, I don't, I didn't catch that article as well. This is Michael, but um, regarding young folks, uh, one of the things that I did want to highlight related to that is the fact that um, within our M AAPI communities, we do have a large percentage of our communities who are immigrants and refugees. And um, I, I, at ACRS, we've been encountering situations, for example, this one particular case where a young person who's uh, uncle tested COVID-19 positive and was hospitalized and his aunt um, who was also uh, uh, tested positive and was self-quarantined um, at home. And neither one of them um, spoke English well um, and because he and his mother had contact with them they too had to self-quarantine and no one was there to help navigate the services and resources and they were literally going hungry. And so this, this is just one example of the tremendous resilience and fortitude of young people who are put into some incredibly important responsible positions to take care of their families. And imagine that happening across all of our communities during this time, amplified, quadruple that, triple that, double that, whatever. Um, but just it's just really um, something that I think about as well. Michael, that is really heartbreaking um, to think about. Um, and I want to come back to some of the impacts on young people in a minute, uh, particularly related to education that a lot of you spoke to. But I also want to catch this related question because all of you commented on the fact that so many of um, the members of um, the communities represented here are essential workers. And um, uh, an audience member asked a really important question and like, what is it uh, that we can do, um, that people can do? What steps can we take to support essential workers, especially workers of color as we move through our daily lives? Um, and so again, any of you who would like to um, address that, I think it would be great. Um, yeah, so for May Day in particular, um, Black Lives Matter Seattle King County did write a petition that we would like to send to the governor and we had a big list of demands for that letter. Um, so I can actually just read them all off to you because I think they really do encapsulate what would be great for essential workers right now. This is a long list, buckle up, but um, livable wages and biannual wage increases, hazard and overtime pay for full and part-time workers, one year moratorium on evictions and foreclosures, accessible free healthcare, uh, protective gear and equipment for essential workers and their household members, um, ongoing direct financial recovery support for housing and other basic needs, strengthening and enforcement of anti-discrimination laws, particularly for LGBTQ, IA uh, communities and formerly incarcerated workers and renters, um, a worker's bill of rights and minimum wage for incarcerated workers who are also essential to the COVID-19 response and recovery, 100% free childcare and 100% free all day kindergarten with transportation for low income families as well as essential workers, free meals for all children and students, free healthcare for undocumented workers, 
free college and apprenticeship for high school graduates and non-graduates, and basic income for all Washingtonians. Just to name a few. I'm sure there's also plenty more. Um, pretty good list. But, yeah, pretty good list. <laughs> Anything any of the other panelists want to add to that about um, protecting and supporting essential workers? Um, I do want to say something, uh, Michelle. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, I've been working in my community for a very long time and I've taught so many different cl classes on organizing and things like that. And one of the things that we always leave out is bringing people from the community, from those essential workers to talk about the issues that they're going through. Sometimes um, we we kind of work with all of us. The, it, we've, we've done this for such a long time that sometimes we think that we know what they need. And so one of the things that I would definitely do is, yes, ask people like us um, how we could help um, or how, you know, what, what we could do to organize and do things like that. But I would love for everybody to ask that question to essential workers. The essential workers have the answers. They know exactly what the issues are. All we got to do is make them a part of the solution as well. And uh, they need to be a part of the, a, a part of this whole strategy. Um, they need to be a part of the table or not a part of the table, but at the table and make some of these changes with all of us because it, it requires all of us to make this change and to really have that, um, uh, that partnership to make these things happen and move forward. I really appreciate that, Gabriel. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of smart people in public health and in a lot of places, um, but the folks who are experiencing a problem often have a really good idea what will help solve that problem. And we always want to make sure that we're talking to those who have been most impacted by a pandemic or by whatever it is. I actually have a question I would like to address to Crystal about um, some of the numbers. So you were mentioning about the Navajo Nation, and it's been really devastating to hear what's happening there. But I noticed um, in Washington state data, we had been involved in asking um, uh, state actors to disaggregate data and help us know more about who is being diagnosed with COVID-19 here in Washington state and who's dying from it. Um, and the, the numbers for indigenous communities were like non-existent, but I know that that can't be right. Do you have some insights into what's up with the undercount um, on Native American people in this state and around the country? Thanks, Michelle. Um, yes, so the disaggregation of data is a huge issue that would benefit indigenous justice, not only in Washington state, but also around the country. Um, just uh, zooming out to the to urban areas in the country first, there there is a recent report that uh, found that about 80% of uh, state health departments that had released some racial demographic data uh, did not in explicitly include Native Americans in their breakdowns and instead categorized them in the label other. So when you don't parse out the data for uh, Native Americans specifically, you cannot capture that and you don't have accurate data. You can't make data-driven decisions and policies that will benefit Natives that are affected by COVID. Um, but then in Washington in particular, Washington has a demonstrated history of making Native Americans invisible through data, not just with missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, but in this pandemic as well. Um, we don't know exactly the numbers, like you said, uh, with COVID and the native uh, communities here, and that's because we, we need that parsed out data. Um, I, does that answer the question? That's actually really helpful. Um, and I hope that we can get those better numbers because it helps us with services, right? right. And that actually just gives me a direct connection back to Ebony because I was so grateful that you mentioned the importance of the census 
specifically related to this pandemic, right? Because if we don't know where people are, we can't ensure that the services are present in their community and that government dollars fund and support the services in their communities that they need, right? So if you're undercounted, you're gonna be underserved. So I'm really grateful that you made that point so eloquently. And I'm just wondering if you could, you know, say more about some of the ways that you're trying to get that awareness top of mind for people when people are just worried about like, can they go to the store and are they safe, right? And so I totally get how some people might not be thinking about filling out the online census, but what are some of the things that you guys are doing to really elevate that point? Right, um, so throughout this entire campaign, um, we have created a series of videos that give some very helpful information um, about the census, why it's important, all that it touches um, within our communities and ways to fill it out and to make sure that that information is accessible and that people have an easier time filling it out, especially since it's online this year. For some people, that'll be a lot more convenient. For others, it'll be a little more challenging. Um, and I can provide a link to our website that kind of provides all of that information. But I guess touching more on, yes, like why it is important that census data is accurate in regards to this pandemic. Um, in the state of Washington, Black people are among the group of people who are more likely to uh, not be insured. They're the least likely to go to the doctor and also are least likely to be included in medical studies. Um, and as I stated earlier, based on the data that we do have already, uh, Black people in the state of Washington um, are experiencing cases twice the rate per capita compared to white people, which is pretty, <laughs> Pretty alarming take that we also don't make that much of the population in Washington state, as we know thus far. Um, but it's also still not a requirement still for Washington state to record data um, based on race for COVID-19 related infections and death. So already we're kind of like behind the curve on terms of just trying to make sure that everything is accurate and we witness what the devastating impacts that can lead to in our communities not just in a pandemic but just in other forms of illness as well a really great example of that would be breast cancer in black women um, studies have shown that black women are diagnosed with breast cancer less than white women but are still more likely to die from it um, black women are actually 40 percent more likely to die from breast cancer than white women which is again very alarming and so when we're not being fully counted and included in this initial, you know, testing and treatment and when we're less likely to seek medical treatment to begin with or more likely to be refused medical treatment as well that has very lasting impacts on our community that can just be devastating. And I think with something like this that's so new where discoveries are being made about it every day, it's vital that we can be as accurate as possible um, during this time. Not of course just for black people, for all people of color and everyone, because we still don't know how this virus is affecting people based on race or other factors um, about themselves. So um, for me, I think, yes, there is a really big push. And what we've been advocating for through all of this, through the census and through our work for COVID-19, that it is extremely important right now to have the accurate data and to really push for our state officials and our government and public health to really take that seriously um, for the future. Thank you, Ebony. And I know our team is gonna be getting that, those links in the chat box so that people can see the great BLM materials that have been put together, um, have some stars in it. I'm not gonna say name any names, but <laughs> um, actually there's some amazing community members that you pull together um, for, the, for that work and it's been really fantastic to see. I wanted to come back to Michael because um, I was thinking about the story you told in response to a question a moment ago about the family where the uncle got sick and then there was a young person at home and you know there were language barriers and there wasn't food. And um, so I kind of wanted to take a moment to just talk about food security and how that's showing up in your community and what ACRS and others are doing to address that because hunger is a very real issue. and. Um, would just love to um, hear what your teams are doing. Well, thank you, Michelle. Yes, uh, for uh, those who may not know, ACRS is a major uh, food nutrition program service provider, and we have a food bank down on King Street 
in the Chinatown International District. And um, in the aftermath of um, all the new public guidance uh, that came out that restricted and limited uh, people moving around, uh, we saw that our numbers at of older adults and frail people and others within the Chinatown International District stopped coming to the food bank. And so we re immediately needed to retool and work with different partners to get food to people um, where they live because they were afraid that being outside might put them at higher risk. So working with Metro to um, work on tr um, having their vans come and pick up um, fresh bags of groceries and prepared meals to be delivered to many of the senior affordable housing buildings across um, Chinatown International District and beyond um, is one of the things that we did as a response. In addition, we worked with Evergreen Treatment Services as well to make sure that individuals who are experienced, who are working through recovery, um, are challenged in accessing food. Um, we're making to make sure that they are also have access. What we also had to do was because the food bank in the Chinatown International District is in an old mobile um, home complex, it doesn't allow for us to do the proper social distancing, especially for clients to come in or volunteers to come in and help prepare bags. So we had to transport our operation to our large gymnasium over on MLK um, to help do the prepping and packaging and the cooking necessary. And at the, at the onset of this pandemic, I mean, we doubled our capacity, not only on um, grocery bags, but also on prepare, prepared meals from our kitchen. So this year, ACRS is celebrating its 30th anniversary. We annually do an event called the Walk for Rice, which raises money for to fight hunger. And unfortunately, um, as we originally planned to have it in person, which is a walkathon around Seward Park, um, we're doing that virtually and we are um, we're welcoming any support that folks have to offer and you can find more information about that event virtual event on www.walkforrice.org thank you michael um i've been to walk for rice for many years and it's a great um event and i just when I saw the announcement, that was, of course, no surprise that it wasn't going to happen in person this year. I just felt like this hole, <laughs> this walk for rice sized hole um, in my being because it's just one of those community things. And it's been such a beautiful thing because so members of so many different kinds of communities come out and support the um, ACRS. And I know that the food that you all provide is served uh, not just to Asian communities, but to all communities. And so I hope that people can participate in that. Um, I, uh, boy, I know we're nearly out of time and I've told we're gonna go just a few more minutes because the conversation is so rich, but I see a couple of questions here that I wanna come to. And one of them, this is really interesting and I can and relate to this because I grew up in a multi-generational household um, and a person in the audience was commenting about some reports that propose, uh, suggest that um, black and indigenous people of color communities are often, are, are maybe in part hit harder because some of those households are multi-generational, have more than two to three people. And the question was, is this something that you all are seeing in your work um, as um, you know, a factor that you, you find yourselves dealing with in your work? And anyone could respond to that. <laughs> uh, Michelle, I'm absolutely seeing uh, in the families that I'm working with, um, I'm seeing trends that of multi-generational households. Um, I don't, you know, these households that um, the living spaces are sometimes a bit smaller and so it's harder to distance, um, especially from somebody who's in your household, uh, that if somebody in the house is infected um, with COVID-19, then that's going to spread more, it's going to be, it's just going to spread quicker than if that uh, household was smaller if it was able to uh, sequester everybody in separate rooms, but sometimes it just isn't possible. And I am seeing, I'm definitely seeing that trend with the families I'm working with. Thank you, Crystal. I also wanted to uh, catch this other observation. So this was someone who's been 
uh, paying attention to the Tyson plant in Wallula um, and how that was handled. And um, this person's observing that um, when all the Tyson workers were first tested, the numbers were released and reported in the press. But uh, this person says, as near as I can tell, those numbers are no longer being made available. So now it's hard to know what's going on in the plant in terms of number of infections, protective measures. So now here, moving that into what's happening in Washington with agriculture, um, just that concern about is there testing? Are we getting information? Or is there a sort of a deference to agribusiness and, and you know, hiding that? So I don't know if this is something, Gabriel, that you are dealing with or trying to get more information about, but I think this is a very serious issue. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's a great question. It's a good observation, too, because a lot of people aren't thinking about these things. And um, this, is, this is what's happening. A lot of these businesses, because at the end of the day, they're a business. And um, they need, they want to make money and they want to make a lot of money. And so what happens is with all of these guidelines and all of these things that are, um, that are taking place right now because of this epidemic, uh, a lot of these businesses like the farms and fruit warehouses and these meat packaging, uh, they're trying to do as much as they can before they have to reduce their workforce or a lot of people get sick. And one of the things that they're avoiding is trying to is avoiding the, uh, the fact that people are getting infected and they're not telling other employees that there is, um, that, that many have tested positive for COVID-19. And this becomes a big problem because people are going to work thinking that everything's okay because nobody's saying anything and they're hiding from uh, the, these, these laws where they can't really tell people who got sick and things like that. And I think um, for this epidemic, I think, we really need to start paying attention to why aren't they informing people in the community, especially if people are working there. And the reason why this is a huge factor, we talked about housing, uh, Crystal, thank you so much for, for bringing that up. Um, right now here in the Yakima Valley, we have a shortage of housing. And so when somebody gets infected in one of these warehouses, you're going back to five, six family members that have no idea that you just got infected because you don't have any knowledge that somebody at your workplace got infected. And so now you just infected six people in your family in that same household because sometimes you have two or three families living in that one house. And so, um, yes, it's, be, it's a huge problem. A lot of people don't know that they're um, that their uh, uh, their coworkers are infected. And so this is again, creating a bigger issue especially here in the Yakima County. Thank you so much. And there's been a question too about like, you know, what are the organizations that people can support? And, you know, we've shared information about all of your organizations and I know some of your organizations also link to other um, resources. So some, some information is probably gonna get shared about that in the chat box for our attendees shortly. Um, I do wanna have us wrap up and I think what I'd like maybe each of you to address is um, what is something that you would love for our participants to know that they can do? Um, and then also um, what is giving you hope or strength right now? Um, so um, maybe if I go in the order we began, Crystal, if you don't mind me starting with you, or if you wanna punt to somebody else and somebody else is ready, that's also fine. <laughs> oh, no, I'm happy to, to share. Um, Listeners can get involved. Uh, there will be links that um, Native American Community Response Fund is one of the links that will be sent out post the webinar uh, recording. And that's a, that's a combination of, um, it's, a, it's a place where you can donate that, that, that pools, I think right now it's over $800,000, but it pools funds that then this uh, organization then divvies out to local organizations working with Native Americans in need right now and that are directly affected by COVID. Um, so that's something that one thing that I would say that I would um, that I would suggest. And then the the second part, Michelle, was that what's what what is giving me hope? Uh, it's well, giving me hope or strength right now. Yeah. Um, I mean, anytime you talk about indigenous struggles, I always have to talk about resilience because all, you know, all of my uh, 
native cousins, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, we all have strength and resilience in our DNA and that shows even today uh, with our response to COVID. There have been tribal governments, entire tribal governments that have moved online for the first time and in such quick turnarounds, there's, there are checkpoints at tribal nations to assert sovereignty and to assert tribal sovereignty. There have been virtual powwows, dance specials, virtual graduations, uh, and just really uh, moves that are showing that uh, Native people step up to help other Native people. And that gives me a lot of strength. It gives me a lot of hope. Um, and it just reinforces that we're a very, very resilient people. Thank you so much, Crystal. Ebony, would you like to go? Yes. Um, in terms of things that people can do right now, um, our chapter just posted a, uh, a series of links on our Facebook page, so Black Lives Matter, Seattle King County on Facebook. We just made a post providing some donation links for families and uh, community members who are trying to support those who have recently lost their lives to police brutality. So please make sure to check that out. Um, there are a lot of people on the ground right now who could use their support uh, for their communities and the families that are dealing with these losses right now. Um, and in terms of further action that we can do, I mean, as I said in the beginning of this, I think participating in these types of discussions, listening, learning, understanding where all of these communities are coming from. In this panel alone, we're able to touch on so many shared experience, I think, as people of color. Um, but also, to me, it's been very interesting seeing in the very specific ways that these systems directly affect our people in very unique ways. And I think that really shows just how much um, these systems and white supremacy, to put it frankly, uh, can get into our communities in the different ways that they try to erase us or um, oppress us or try and make it so we can't survive in these circumstances. Um, so I've, I always encourage education, participating, listening, understanding how this really is impacting all of us. Um, and in terms of more positive things that are happening in terms of how um, community is coming together. I really feel Crystal um, just talking about how, resi how resilient our people can be and how even through all of these times, you know, we're still trying to make community for one another. And so for myself, um, Black Lives Matter, along with a number of Black organizations within Washington and King County um, that make up the Black Census Caucus are putting on a week-long celebration for Juneteenth. So that'll be our Juneteenth week celebration from June 15th to June 21st. I will provide a link for that for people to check out, but it will be a huge series of events. Um, movie screenings, dance classes, yoga classes, prayer, a great history of Juneteenth. Black Lives Matter in particular will be hosting a Black Pride night um, and series of events. So I'm very much looking forward to that because as much, you know, as you want to keep on putting out awareness and how important that is. I think it's also great for us to come together and just celebrate in what we can. And yeah, in all of these new ways that are virtual and ways that we didn't think that we would be coming together. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And I'll definitely provide some information for you all to share. We have discovered that it's possible to have a party on Zoom, right? <laughs> <laughs> Michael, how about you? What would you like people to know and also what, um, as, as far as how they can help and, and what's giving you hope and strength in these times? Yeah, I think with the concern around the increase in hate crimes and harassment and bias, I would encourage folks to check out a bystander training that's available. It's um, put together by an organization called Hollaback and Asian Americans for Advancing Justice. And they have a series of online webinar trainings on how you can be an active bystander. And some of the techniques that they're showing, are th I mean, are sharing are things that we can do, which is basically if you see harassment going on, to go up to the, the victim and do something like, excuse me, do you know which way to go to get to this place and to redirect that conversation? So it's not about 
direct com confrontation as a bystander, but using different strategies and techniques to help become an important ally and supporter for that victim um, in the instance that they are be experiencing hate crime. Um, the, the one thing that I'm really hope, uh, hopeful about is the fact that um, an example of, of resilience that we're seeing in our communities, how if we're, uh, our communities are seeing that Asian, Amer Asian American run restaurants are really not um, getting the business that they need. And so communities and community-based organizations and even individuals are, are proactively going out and ordering takeout from um, Asian run businesses. And, and there are different groups that are organizing large scale um, purchases from these different businesses. And what that tells me, and this is related to what Crystal and Ebony had shared, is that the solutions for this pandemic and the recovery is within us and our communities. And, and that is something that I'm very hopeful about. That's awesome. So Gabriel, you get you get the floor next. Yes. Well thank you so much. Um you know I, I'm I am out there most of the time and I'm not afraid to get involved. And um, it, it's sometimes it's a little bit difficult for others. So the very first thing that I always tell people, get on Facebook. That's the easiest way to get involved. Go to a lot of these Facebook pages, um, ACLU, uh, LULAC, you got Latino Civic Alliance, everybody here, go to their Facebook page, find out what they're working on. Uh, message them and ask them, hey, how can I be a part of this, right? This is the easiest way to get involved. Another way to get involved, it's the same thing, go on Facebook and look at who your representatives are. They have a like page, go on their like page, comment on, on some of the things that they're talking about, ask them these questions. Um, the second thing that I would suggest is to really go out there and be a part of some of these, um, uh, be a part of these organizations, either by volunteering, helping out with whatever you can. Um, it could be an hour or two, or be a part of these Zoom and uh, Zoom meetings. Uh, they're very informative, and um, you get to learn a little bit about what everybody else is doing. And um, that really helped me out a lot when I was first starting. Um, um, and then, you know, what am I help? Why am I? Uh, what gives me hope, right? What gives me hope is that all of us today are talking about some of the same things that are affecting the Latino community, Native American, you know, and uh, African American communities. We're seeing that, that we're, we're um, that even though we're facing these huge problems that we're still here, that we're still involved and that we're always communicating with other organizations, other agencies to figure out ways to improve our lives, to improve uh, the conditions that, that we're living through and, and our community members. And that really, uh, um, it makes me, it, it, sometimes I, I, I get emotional because these are uh, very difficult situations. Um, just a couple of days ago, I found out that, it, uh, um, this older man, uh, my, my one of my friend's father passed away from COVID-19. And even though he's going through that, he is still a part of this. He's learning and he's a part of these, again, these organizations that are moving these things forward. And regardless of, of, of what's happened to us, we keep on moving forward. And that gives me courage and it makes me feel good to be doing the work that I'm doing. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gabriel. So uh, such a common theme for all of you is about resilience. It's about people coming together, both within identified communities as well as beyond those communities coming together with each other. That is, that is definitely um, a, a moment for hope and strength in that. So four bullet points to close us out because I know people are ready to call it a night. I wanna say first to all of you panelists, you are beautiful and brilliant humans. I am so grateful for you and for the work that you do in the community, for your passion, for your dedication, for your spirit of lifelong learning and openness and really trying to figure out how we can do better and how we can stay strong. And I'm just incredibly grateful for you spending the time with us and the people in the audience, we can't hear them clap, but I know they're clapping and I'm clapping. So that's bullet point number one. 
bullet point number two is to those of you who are in the audience who are still hanging out some people have left but some of you are still here so grateful to you for listening um, for your wonderful questions and for caring enough to spend this time with us this evening um, on a topic that's frankly heavy, right? And at a time that is very heavy with things that are happening in the world. And um, so just gratitude for you, gratitude so many people asking, how can I help? You are wonderful. I can't see you, but I know you're beautiful too. Okay, my third bullet point. Um, Obviously, there are some ACLU staff behind the scenes making this thing happen this evening. <laughs> they are fielding questions. They are sending information out in the chat box. Um, they are nameless and faceless in this moment to you, but they are there. I am grateful. You know who you are. Um, <laughs> you can see me looking at you. Um, and uh, so thank you. Thank you to the staff who are making this happen. And then finally, um, uh, as we noted earlier, OC Notes has some music on Spotify because now probably is a good time to dance if you dance. And so uh, the information has been shared in the, in the box there so that you can connect to it and participate. And I think uh, whatever links we failed to get out in this chat right now, we will follow up with by email for people who are registered for this event. I know people asked about the bystander training and about some other things, and I can't tell if that came up or not. So just know that we will do our best to get all the information for you. I want to say thank you, everyone. Be safe. Be well. We are in this together. Good night.